so anyone looking to collect these rifles or, or finding one available, there are going to be a lot of variances in the, the Chiang Kai-shek rifles. Yeah, there's majorly four of them, right? And uh, if you look at a marking, and I think I state uh, I have a marking in the book, there are about uh, six, seven you know, different markings. And then there's one from the uh, Guangdong arsenal, later become the 21st, uh, become the 11th. Okay. I'm sorry, 41st. 41st arsenal. And there was one originally from the Gongxian, become the 11th. And then the uh, Hanyang later on took over the 11th uh, you know, rifle factory and started making their own. So uh, even though the marking are different, they actually are the same drawing and same people okay. are making them. And then the 21st was the uh, latest. And they start producing in the late, late war and it's quickly become the uh, uh, biggest producer. And you can see they all have different serial number range as well. Okay. Uh, the uh, 21st, they started with A and the fourth, not four digit. And if they, uh, the first one is zero, they eliminate it. So, for example, the 321 would be A321. Right? Okay. And then if it's A1, A2, A221, it's just A21. And then uh, by uh, 1949, they, uh, the arsenal fell into the communist hand. They pretty much already used you know, to the end of the uh, two digits. So it becomes A, 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 B, A, C, A, B, to A, Z, that type of thing. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if you collect all four of them, obviously they will complete the series. And then there's also variance in terms of the bell nets. Uh, the, uh, they were majorly two kinds. Uh, there's uh, metal scabbards, and then there's leather scabbards. And then uh, very late in the war, that, uh, you know, during the Civil War period, actually, Mm -hmm. that uh, material was very scarce. So they start making a whole uh, ladder, like a hunting knife. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Was there a lot of, were, were there some periodic changes as the war progressed? Uh, there's not much changes. Uh, mm -hmm. They just kind of, because it's wartime, you know, for the, uh, to save, you know, time and save trouble, they just, you know, do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, for, and you can look at that, uh, for example, like the ZB-26, the Chinese produce one, still have all the fins. Even mm -hmm. though today we all know it's a waste of time right. Right, to do that, but they just continue to make fins. It's not like they haven't seen the brain gun. They have seen the brain gun, but it's a, hey, let's just not change it, just do it. You know, the way that it's easier to spend more and, and not have to risk any, like. yeah, risk any problem. Okay. It's interesting comparing that to the evolution of the Japanese small arms of the time, where there was a very distinct change in features dramatically simplifying the guns as the war went on. Mm -hmm. um, I expect the difference is the Japanese arsenal, arsenals were all under direct bombing attack, mm -hmm. where the Chinese arsenals were located inland far enough. That In the cave, and, uh, and compared to the uh, Japanese, I guess you can say that China was not in such a big uh, uh, scarcity of uh, materials, no. even though it was still very difficult, but uh, it wasn't as bad. Okay, they and had some natural resources yes. available mm -hmm. in China. Yes. So you mentioned the ZB-26. Mm -hmm. um, was that the predominant light machine gun used? Yes, it's, it's a predominant uh, before the war. Actually, China actually went into an agreement with the uh, Bernal, tried to make them a local copy, licensed copy, but because of German uh, you know, invasion and the uh, Japanese invasion, the plan fell through. Right. And there's also another plan to adopt the Madison, right? mm -hmm. light machine gun, heavy machine gun with that tripod uh, thing to become a standard. And the contract was signed, many was printed in the, you know, Denmark, and uh, you know, material machinery all purchased. But unfortunately, the machinery was bombed uh, in Burma Road and destroyed. <laughs> and so they turned, the factory turned back into uh, a ZB-26 mm -hmm. that they're familiar with. So throughout the war, yeah, ZB-26 was the uh, predominant uh, light machine gun okay. for Chinese. How, how, um, how many heavy machine guns were available? Were there not many around, or, or what type of model did? Well, the, the heavy machine gun uh, you know, is on the battalion level. Okay. And so if you compare to, uh, it's not as many as the uh, you know, World War I, the German uh, T-O-N-E uh, situation. So in uh, each battalion, you will have a one heavy machine gun uh, company, and uh, each company will have four, obviously four of the, uh, you know, platoons, and each platoon will have two guns. Okay. So you, you can look at the eight, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, for the, you know, the, uh, 
uh, a a battalion, and the, usually it was uh, assigned out to the company level, so the company uh, commander would uh, have the right to deploy them in the front line or you know behind that line, any way they choose to. And the pre primary uh, heavy machine gun produced in China was the uh, uh, the Type 24. The Type 24 was in production uh, before 1935 for eight years already. But uh, 1935, China got some uh, drawing from Germany and then refined uh, a lot of the, uh, the little parts and changed the little things and then standardized it on the Type 24. Okay, so, so Type 24 being a Maxim gun. Yes, it's a Maxim, it's a water cool machine gun, and that's a primer, the predominant uh, heavy machine gun during the war. And they also produced another uh, heavy machine gun that's a copy of Browning 1917. They call it, you know, Type 30. Uh, because it would, the original production started in the 10th uh, the year, 10th month, and 10th day. And 10th month and 10th day was the, uh, uh, the national holiday, national day for uh -huh. the uh, Republic. And it was the 1921 equivalent to 10th year. So it's called three tenths. But it's a copy of the uh, Brown the 1917. And the quantity was fairly small, and uh, not uh, in the level of the uh, uh, Type 24. Okay. So it's, it's here and there, you know. It makes sense if you have limited materials, mm -hmm. you can get more general use out of rifles and small arms than, than building a whole lot of expensive heavy machines. And also they didn't have the uh, uh, standardization on that, so it was produced you know, pretty much by hand, and so the quality was uh, you know, kind of short. And they have tried to uh, get the drawing from the United States and then try to get a drawing from Belgium, but they can't get it. So eventually, they uh, focus on the Type 24. Okay. The the nationalist government in China had didn't have real good control over the entirety of the country. Uh, Correct. There was a lot of uh, tell us how much how much individual arms production or or. Um, yeah, China uh, was a like I said in the book. China was a uh, a concept, not a country. And uh, there were a lot of these local warlords and the uh, you know, communist mm -hmm. dominated region and throughout the world. And uh, in Shanxi, for example, there's a, a huge arsenal, Shanxi arsenal. And in Manchuria, there's another one. And uh, that, these are, and eventually that fell into Japanese hand, become one of the four main arsenal for the uh, Japanese empire. And so these are you know, not in, under control of the central government. And pretty much the central government only had control of the Yangtze River and the adjacent area, okay. right? And so, the, uh, for example, the Jingling Arsenal became the 21st that was under the government control and become a very good arsenal. And the Shanghai Arsenal was uh, shut down after a while, uh, you know, the, uh, and it was oldest. And the Guangdong Arsenal uh, was only when the, uh, the warlord was chased away you know, that become under the government control. Uh, and the Shanxi and Shan, Guangxi has, uh, you know, another arsenal was under the Guangxi clique, right? So these are all nationalists, right? They all claim the, you know, national, but because the power, the ideology, one thing or the other, and they are not fully under control of the central government. Okay, was there a lot of difference in production between arsenals directly under the national government control and those under control of various well, warlords? Yeah, under the, the arsenal under the uh, government control tend to be more uh, un the, uh, formalized. Right? They were, because these are the people who actually study abroad, so they mm -hmm. brought the Western techniques and uh, management and all that uh, into the production. Okay. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Um, I know I certainly have learned quite a bit um, from our discussions and from reading the book. Um, again, if you have any further interest in the subject, I would strongly recommend picking up a copy of Bin's book. Um, it is in two parts. First half is the, the Chinese published uh, part in color with all the with color photographs. And then the companion volume, uh, black and white photographs and all the text translated to English. Um, I found it useful to get both. Um, some of the photos in this are a little bit darker. I think it's nice to have the color ones as well. Um, best place to get this is Bin's website. That's uh, www.chinesefirearms.com. I'll have a link to that on the website. 
and uh, take a look. I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks for watching.